This is The Blockchain Show. Hello and welcome to The Blockchain Show. Today we're talking about feeding the world with Alvaro. I think everybody who's listening knows who I am. My name's Ian Collins. I'm going to be facilitating this conversation. So, Alvaro, okay, tell our wonderful listeners to this podcast who you are and what you're doing here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. My name is Alvaro. I'm the founder and CEO of eHarvest Hub, and where we're making fresh food more affordable and accessible to everyone. The goal is to connect small to mid-sized farmers directly with grocery chains and independent truckers. So remove all the unnecessary layers of middlemen uh, that cause our food to zigzag seven to 10 times before it even makes it to the store, which leaves you know, farmers and truckers with very little profit and they're the most hard and working people in the industry. And then as consumers paying high prices for our food, you know, and uh, we are doing all, uh, removing all those unnecessary layers to make this uh, simple and uh, allow small farmers around the world to really participate in the global economy. Uh, because right now you, you're able to buy food, you know, you could buy tomatoes year round uh, from your local store, but that's because they're sourcing it from somewhere else. So we want to make sure that our food system is efficient and affordable uh, and accessible for everyone. Yeah, this is this is really important because this has happened in England, I know, with milk, where the supermarket chains have squeezed the farmers on prices so much that a lot of businesses actually could not afford to produce the milk unless they had large-scale farms, which meant that the quality, of course, went down and the farmers actually had to join together to rebel against the supermarkets and say, this is ridiculous. We cannot make products this cheaply. You know, that's an actually interesting, uh, not interesting, but it's a very common problem for farmers around the world. It doesn't matter where that farmer is. They face the same issues. And one is that every time the supply chain once changes, uh, somebody's going to incur that cost. And that cost is paid by the farmer, but nobody's willing to pay the higher prices. Um, you know, we always see the grocery store at our end, you know, as consumers, because that's where we shop. But the reality is that there are so many people between them and the farmer for the most part. And everybody's taking a cut <clears throat> from there. Uh, you, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be surprised to find out that actually retailers take very little profit from fresh food. Uh, because everybody else has to get paid. And the best way to look at fresh food when it comes to a retailer is that's exactly what attracts people into their store. That's why you see all the perimeter in the back, you know, filled with fresh food because it makes you go all the way through the, you know, to the store, but they actually make their money on the aisles on all the products sitting on the aisles. Um, food is what attracts people. in. so the, the less expensive they can source it, the better, the, the more transparency they can get. And, and sourcing that food, it's even better for them because it's about attracting more food traffic to their store. So when I did my discovery, you know, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, talking to retailers, that was one of the biggest things that they said. Of it. And, when, and I was actually surprised to hear them talk about their willingness to pass on savings to consumers when it came to fresh food. Uh, but, you know, but it goes back to that, you know, it's what attracts people into their stores. The, the challenge of the farmer having to, you know, make things better in a different way, you know, with incurring costs and nobody's willing to pay, it becomes really difficult for them to do business. Um, and that was part of what, you know, when I did my discovery talking to farmers, because I'm not a farmer, so I had to go figure out what were the problems that farmers were facing. And it was always the, you know, especially when it came to technology, it was, hey, technology is extremely complicated and then it's expensive. You know, I had a farmer that told me once, he was like, the problem with your technology, guys, is that you show up once a year, you charge me your licensing fee, and you walk away. You could care less if I made money or not that year. I still had to pay you. So, you know, I'm not going to pay you unless I have to. I'm not going to use technology unless I have to. So you have to be, you have to really think through that problem and how you're going to set up the business when it comes to technology so you can get better adoption from farmers. Um, <clears throat> so... Especially like if you're talking about blockchain technology, you know, we all get excited about blockchain because it can do a lot of different things. The decentralization that it creates is amazing. But you don't go sell a farmer blockchain technology because it doesn't mean anything to him if he doesn't transfer into lower cost or higher profits. 
you know, and so uh, when I talk about my business model, you know, this is a lot of people is asking me about the technical aspects of it and how I sell these to a farmer. Like I don't, I don't tell them to blockchain. I don't sell them smart contracts. I tell them I can give you technology that allows you to meet food safety standards and regulations so that you can sell your product. And that is extremely valuable to a farmer, you know, and then I don't charge for my technology. So you have to build the right business model with the technology. For it to be successful absolutely and this is something which is so key in the industry at the moment that we need to sell a solution we need to package up the best of technology and the best way to get into technology which means something to that consumer of the technology we can't go in and say hey we've got blockchain it's just like bitcoin it's going to save the world it's not going to work so i can understand that point of view and the first thing that comes to mind when you mention that model is Amazon, because I know Amazon has said, if you're not producing anything, if you're just transporting or selling goods, we're coming after you. And I know in America, they've just bought the whole foods chain and you can get 10% discount on your shopping if you've got Prime. I, I'm wondering whether Amazon are actually looking at how they can optimize the delivery of food <coughs> from the actual producer to the stores to get it to the consumer and eventually do away with stores. I imagine that they are looking at this as well. Yeah, you know, one of the, uh, one of the biggest things that I, uh, you see from uh, retailers is, and when I did my discovery, you know, back then, you know, I sat down with, uh, with Walmart, buyers from Walmart, and their biggest thing was like, look, the closer the product is to our, to our delivery pickup or point, the cheaper it is. Because we're a logistics company, at the end of the day, trying to make sure that it's cost effective to transport product. The challenge that they have going straight to farmers is, and you're talking about mid to small farmers that produce 60% of the food, you know, 60 to 70% of the food worldwide. Um, but the challenge was the aggregation of volume. That's extremely expensive having to source individually from farmers all the time. Because you, this week you buy from a farmer, next week you have to find a different farmer because the volume is just not there. Right? So you have to be able to aggregate. That's why distributors, wholesalers, and brokers exist because they can do all of that. Uh, but there's no visibility to that inventory from for retailers. And so that was the idea for us is you have to be very methodical about how you're going to do that. And, you know, uh, we said, okay, we're going to give farmers traceability software, which allows them to meet all these regulations and the industry standards on how to track and trace product for contamination purposes. That became an inventory management system that now a grocery buyer, uh, you know, can look at that inventory. The next piece of that was, well, how do, how do I shop from your farmers if I have to keep doing it individually when our system aggregates all that volume? So if, let's say, a, uh, a buyer from a grocery store comes in and says, I want to buy 1,000 pounds of potatoes, and I have three farmers that have all combined that volume, right? the next thing is I want to place one order. I don't want to place a bunch of orders. And that means I have to negotiate prices with every, every single one because they're always negotiating prices on product. So we give them the ability on our marketplace where they can negotiate prices in real time with one farmer. And once they do that, all the pricing changes so that all the farmers are able to participate in that order and then the volume is aggregated. Uh, and that's extremely valuable for a buyer. The other part of it is the transportation. Sometimes, for example, if you ship out, you know, cantaloupes from California to, you know, Orlando, that the whole truck looking costs you maybe about $6,000 of product, but the transportation is going to cost you seven, dollars $8,000. So now you have to figure out how you're going to lower that expense. Right? So our system does all of that for them because now they're dealing directly with independent truckers that there are no brokers in between. Uh, so it's a lot cheaper. So almost like an Uber, the big difference of what we do is that we as eHarvest Hub do not get involved in the transactions. We really created a free enterprise marketplace uh, for these individuals to interact with each other. Um, and you know, that allows you to lower cost everywhere. Uh, it gives you the transparency. It gives you long-term, uh, you know, shelf life for the product. Uh, so by the time the store gets it, they know they're not going to lose a lot of money because the product is shrinking, you know, meaning there's a lot of water loss, uh, of the product, uh, or going bad because it's been harvested for so long. Uh, so you solve a lot of the, a lot of those issues, uh, for grocery stores. Okay. I understand that. So. Before we get into the technology of this and really, really excite everybody listening to this, how does this actually change the farmer and what the farmer is doing? So let, let's say I'm a farmer using traditional methods. Um, what changes uh, with you and how, how do you 
how do you implement that for them? So yeah, so the implementation is a, it's a, it's a big deal and you have to do baby steps. You can't go to farmers and dump all this technology on them because it's, it overwhelms them and they have a lot of work. I mean, these people are working from, you know, 3, 4 a.m. all the way to 10 p.m., you know, harvesting their products. So you have to be, um, look at the, uh, the processes, how they do it, and you begin to implement the little steps. You know, we always start with traceability first because that is the very immediate thing to meet that regulation and the industry standards because then nobody buys a product if you can't track it or trace it because it makes it safer that way. Um, so we start with that step. And that's just about inventory. You know, give me, give me all your product inventory so that we can upload it in the system and then teach our employees how to use it. Our technology is extremely simple. Um, you know, we build it so that it, it almost looks like an, like an app, even if you're on a desktop, so that their employees can quickly um, use the service. And most, most, of, most of the farmers that we've gone to, our employees take about five, 10 minutes to learn the software, and then they're up and running. The, um, the big impact to that is that, you know, now you can sell directly to a retailer because you have inventory that's accessible to them. And the inventory is real-time inventory. It's not about... You know, we have competitors that, are, that have marketplaces that a farmer can come in and say, you know, here is, you know, a thousand pounds of potato. But he just enter a number. You know, you don't know if he sold it somewhere else. In our system, we know whether the product is sold. Even if it's sold outside of our marketplace, the farmer has an inventory management system because of traceability. You have to know where the product went. So we know if the inventory exists or not. That's a big plus for retailers and for the farmer to be able to manage their product. So a lot, there's a lot of... Um, benefits you know of knowing your inventory you know whether you're underselling or overselling your products so you avoid all those issues uh, but you know being able to sell directly to a retailer it increases your profit margin we had a farmer that was selling their product for twenty dollars a box commercial box and uh when to a distributor when they were able to reach the retailer now they were able to sell it for thirty dollars so you can increase profit margins dramatically uh for farmers the, you know, but you go through those baby steps. So we did traceability. Then we say, here's the order management system. Now we know your inventory. We have to know where the product is going. We need to know which truck is moving that product, all for food safety purposes. Then you're able to, mar to um, surface inventory into a marketplace where they can now interact directly with, with a buyer. The neat thing about a marketplace is that, you know, if you're selling to a, you know, to a Kroger, and Safeway, so it's also in their shopping, they'll be able to see your inventory. So you don't have to go market yourself to anybody. You know, uh, the other part of this equation, Ian, is the trucker. The trucker is a big deal um, because, like I told you, sometimes your, your cost of transportation is higher than your cost of food. Uh, so you need to get him involved at, uh, at the beginning. And for truckers, there's a, there's a few things that you have to do. They have to meet regulations on uh, sanitary uh, record keeping for their trucks. So you, they have to, we have to know what was loaded in their truck before they loaded food or, or, or how they cleaned it. That has to be there. So they have to meet that we allow them to do that with a transportation platform. But also being able to know uh, where these truckers are at, you know, so that they can pick up load and, ma and make transportation more efficient that way. So we solve a lot of things for truckers, but one is you have to give them consistency of loads. And, you know, we have farmers right now that in the next year are going to generate 1.8 million transactions. So it's easier for me to go to an independent trucker and say, you know what, I have farmers with loads already. So you don't have to go find a broker that can give you a load. It's right there and you interact directly. Uh, the other part is, you know, they want to make more money per load. And that means you have to eliminate the need of brokers. My brother is a trucker. And uh, I remember when I was doing my discovery in that year, his broker made as much money as my brother, all because of, he just connected my brother with a shipper. But my brother carried all the liability of moving that product, paid for all the insurances, and his broker paid for nothing. But he made the same amount of money. You know, so we removed that layer. That, then it's no longer needed because of technology. Um, you know, but you have to make it simple at the end of the day. And this is the part that, I think a lot of technology companies in our space miss. You know, it's, it has to be extremely simple because there are people that are working, moving all the time. Uh, and so, you know, solve the business, the business issue first, then worry about how cool the tech is. Absolutely. I totally agree. So where does the blockchain fit into this <laughs> and what does your product actually look like? So let me go, let me take a step back here. In, uh, in 2016, I raised money from... Uh, a little bit over a million dollars from Tim Draper and, uh, and my gang, the uh, founding uh, investor for OKX, uh, to build my original technology. It had nothing to do with blockchain. It was really about solving the problem that we, we had found. And uh, 
last year, um, one of my friends said, you need to look at smart contracts because it does what you're looking for on your marketplace. And the problem that we were looking at solving in the marketplace was farmers and truckers don't get paid right away, you know, as, as it stands. You know, product gets shipped and, you know, three, four weeks later, they're getting paid after the product has been received and probably even sold to consumers already. All right, so the why are these people not getting paid uh, fast enough? And so, you know, and that was because buyers are not, don't have visibility to the whole process, to the product. And so this is where blockchain became important, where you can create a true transparency of every single step. You know, you mix it with IoT for transportation so they know exactly where the product is at all times. So there's records of all of that. Uh, that becomes critical for a buyer to be able to say, okay, I can pay because I've seen the quality of the product from the beginning. I, and I and I receive what I was supposed to receive from from the get go, um, and this is you know where now you you bring the smart contract into play where you can create the escrow account where the buyer can deposit funds, and farmers and truckers are able to get paid right away as soon as the product is delivered versus having to wait thirty days out, uh, and sometimes not get paid because quality of the product was bad so you got destroyed and there's no way to verify it at this point, um, and that's why I got really excited about it <clears throat> the. Um, um, you know, so I have my development team that built my original technology that's already being used by farmers. You know, we go back and say, okay, let's look at blockchain. How does it work? How are we going to do this? Uh, because it makes a lot of sense. The transparency, it removes the, and it creates a trustless environment where you don't need third parties to be verifying anything. Uh, and the smart contract that allows buyers to be able to negotiate and pay people on time. You know, uh, retailers don't necessarily not want to pay farmers. Uh, it's a big deal for them if, if there's a delay in payments because it could potentially be a PR nightmare. Imagine a Walmart being being on the news saying they couldn't pay a small farmer in time. <laughs> That's going to be a big nightmare. So that alone uh, solves a big problem for them. Um, the This is where, you know, blockchain and smart contracts uh, became a big deal for us. Uh, the, the cryptocurrency piece of it, we got really excited about it because – you know, our food is um, imported as well. So U.S. imports about $125 million worth of fresh food out of Latin America alone. Uh, and, you know, so do other 25 different countries uh, uh, bring food from the, from the developing world. And cross-border payments are extremely expensive, you know, and we figured that with cryptocurrency, you can minimize those expenses. Um, you know, so then the question became, well, how do you use, you know, a token within, within our platform? And... Uh, you know, the, the, we went back to our farmers and said, you know, if I, if I give you the option to pay me with tokens, would you do that? And the very first question you get from a farmer, as always, is how much does it cost me? Now, you don't have to explain how a token works. You just have to show them this is how much it costs. So the example that we use was if I invoice you $1,000 for a service one month, you're going to have the choice to pay me 1,000 tokens. Right? If the token is being sold at $0.50, cents, you automatically say 50% of my invoice. Right? And that to a farmer makes total sense. For truckers, it was an easier thing because truckers are on the road and when they have to wait, sometimes they'll play games. And at least that's what we found out from truckers. Okay, yeah, I understand tokens because I you know, have video games that use tokens. I understand how it works. I have to buy them if I want to do some extra stuff. Um, but the first thing was, you know, pay us for our services using our token. And that makes it a utility token that is tied into our revenue. And so it's directly tied into well, how much money we make. Uh, the next part of that was, okay, well, let's look at our peer-to-peer. Once we've built enough, um, not trust, but enough, um, we made our, our farmers and truckers comfortable and begin to use it, you know, receive it as a payment. So retailers can pay in tokens uh, and so forth. Right? The next level of that, and this is a very, uh, you know, a longer-term goal is where you and I as consumers, we could potentially replace the bank that lends money to farmers. You know, farmers every year have to borrow money from banks at high interest to be able to start the planting season. What if you and I, you know, are buying product from a farmer in, you know, North Africa or Chile? But, but because of what we do, you're able to see the economics of that farmer and be able to become a lender for them, you know, remotely at a lower cost. And the farmer is able to do their job, you know, pay less, and we reap the rewards of it as consumers, right? You know, I think that's the next level of how cryptocurrency can dis- truly disrupt and decentralize the whole, the whole food industry. Um, you know, that's, that's how we are intending to use uh, the technology and, and, and work with cryptocurrency. Fantastic. So what about, what about launching a coin? Everybody's launching a coin these days. Are you doing an ICO? 
you know, we, uh, we, we've been asked the question, why, why not use the, the current cryptocurrencies out there? And that really went back to, so I learned a lesson uh, a few years back. We uh, deployed one piece of our software without checking with our farmers as we were building it. And when we did it, it just didn't get a good re reception because they got, they got frustrated with it. So we went back to the drawing board and, and included them in every step of the development. So we did the same thing when thinking about a coin. And that was, you know, farmers, uh, once you have them on using your technology, you don't want to send them somewhere else to a different technology. So sending them to an exchange uh, seemed like, a, like something foreign to them because you, they're leaving the system that they trust, you know. And so we decided that we, within our own platform, we build a, you know, if you will, a mini exchange where you can list your token and our farmers can buy it right there in debt without ever leaving our platform. Uh, and so building a token uh, for our own economy made made more sense at that point. If you look, if you really think about it, you know our our coin can become one of the one of the main cryptocurrencies later on, um, and uh, not just because it can work, you know, with you know as as a lending tool later on uh, for farmers, you know, a, a currency, but mainly because it's backed by all the data we have. You know, you can you and I can say, hey, let's create a cryptocurrency that you know lends to farmers, so, uh, you know, and so people can come and buy it. But you then run the same problem that every bank runs into. There are, you know, people that use pen and paper to keep their records, so you have to manually go try to figure out how to underwrite that. Whereas we are collecting the data for very specific purposes that serve the farmer. And then that data makes the cryptocurrency more powerful uh, because it's easier for you and I as consumers at the other side of the world to see the economics of that farmer and use that currency as, uh, you know, as that lending tool. Um, so I think it has the ability to do that. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Absolutely. So, okay, we've got people listening to the podcast at the moment at homes, in the gym, in their cars. Uh, what can they do to help you? And what can they do to get involved? So, you know, we're doing our uh, free ICO. We'll start on uh, June 12th. And so we'd love for people to participate and join us and, you know, uh, contribute to to building our company. Um, so if they can visit, you know, ehhico.com uh, and uh, subscribe to the uh, to the white list is now open. Uh, also join us in Telegram, you know, and engage with us there and spread the word. You know, our what we do is going to be powerful because of the amount of people that we can bring in. You know, on the consumer side as well as the farmers. You know, there's 480 million farmers out there that we, as consumer, depend on. And uh, the best, the best way to support that and remove the power from the, you know, the conglomerates of the food chain, it's to, you know, it's to participate in what we're doing. So yeah, join, you know, contribute, join the whitelist, you know, get to, get to our telegram and, uh, and start participating with us and spread the word. And speaking of spreading the word, how do you recruit these farmers? Do you recruit them one by one or <clears throat> is there some way you go to to find them? Is the farmers forum or something? Yeah, so we do we do go to the conferences, the very specific conferences that small farmers attend to because they trust them. But you get boots on the ground. You know, pharmacy is about relationship building uh, because there are people that own their land for generations and they want to be able to look at you in the eye, shake your head and know that you're going to be there 20 years later, you know, side by side helping them out. And so we're able to do that. But the neat thing about pharmacy is that once you earn that trust with them and you're able to, you, you know, we've gotten 100% implementation on our software. Uh, because we're there for our customers, and so yeah, we we get we get out there, and that's part of raising the money. You know, we're not we're raising the bulk of the money that we're raising, the fifteen million dollars that we're raising, is for growth because we build the underlying technology already that is being used, and now it's about more growth, and so we need to get more boots on the ground. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, we go out there and shake hands, you know, visit the farms. Fabulous! That sounds really good. And so, what are you, what are your predictions for the future? What what's going to happen in the next three years? Part of what we've built with the technology is that it has a viral effect. Right? So I get one farmer. That farmer gives me access to more truckers because truckers show up to their, to their farm to pick up product every day. Right? And so we are able to collect all that data from truckers. Uh, the same thing with buyers. We get to see who their buyers are. So it creates a network effect that you know, we begin to have farmers that work with certain uh, buyers. And now we, through those buyers, we begin to add more farmers. And so you create that viral effect. My goal is that in the next three years, you know, we have, we have some 50,000 farmers at the very least around the world. And that's 480 million of them. But 50,000 farmers that are a foundation, you know, to, to build a world economy uh, for farmers. 
Um, you know, and that's what that's the intention of the fifteen million dollars is to do that for the next three years. You know, and with revenue, <clears throat> I can tell you the next couple of years, just with the farmers that are already using our system, you know, our revenue should be between thirty-five to to forty-five million dollars, just with the two thousand farmers that we have in there. But that's that's the goal right now. Do you see the platform as maybe changing the lives of some of the workers? Well, on a different podcast I work on, we we talked to Alex Rojas and he was talking about the Driscoll strawberry strike. And this, this is like two years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know if it's still going on, but um, some of the conditions he talked about, you know, corporate greed for lack of a better term. Do you see your platform helping those people out on the bottom? Oh yeah. You, you, you bet. You know, um, you know, when you, the neat thing about when you go and talk to mid to small farmers is that, you know, they're family businesses. They're not your Driscoll's of the world that own, you know, a million acres around the world. Uh, for grow, uh, for harvesting. These are yeah. people that own their family, that, you know, the, their family owns the land and the people that they work with, they, they build relationships with. Um, and so, yeah, having given the ability of a, to a farmer to increase their profit margins means that they're also able to take care of the employees better. You know, uh, we have farmers in, uh, in Nicaragua, we have 400 farmers in Nicaragua that the families li- live in the land. You know, and that's part of the deal that farm the the farmers uh, do with their with their employees. Um, but you know, they're not able to pay more because they have to pay you know a middleman to sell their products. So, yeah, definitely you can um, you can impact uh, all of the you know all of the people that are in the space. That's really cool, man. Yeah, yeah you know, and, you know, it was it's interesting your question because I had a farmer uh, here in Salinas, you know, a, a small farmer for for. California and you know about 140 acres of strawberries and um, you know he told me that his profit margin was about four percent at the end of the day and I was completely shocked because you know you can't run a business on a four percent margin that's that's very difficult to stay in business you know but this is what farmers do and then the next question was well, why don't you become an organic farmer you know me not understanding and he said it's expensive to become an organic farmer if I'd been a conventional farmer and he said, you know, most people think that I don't, that conventional farmers don't care about their land, but we do. This is how, what feeds our family. He goes, but if I have the ability financially to become more sustainable, I will do that. So to sustainability to a farming, it's not just, you know, taking care of my land. It means taking care of my, my employees and my environment all around. But you have to increase that profit. And it took me back to something that a mentor of mine told me 20 some years ago and said, Alvaro, you can't ask somebody to become a millionaire. If they're trying to figure out where the next meal is coming from, you need to solve that problem first. You know, this is, this is why I undertook this project in that way, that I have to help the farmer increase the profit because then you can initiate changes. Maybe in the future on like the individual consumer level, say me, like in California, I go to health superstores around and sometimes the only fruit available is from companies that say like Driscoll raspberries Mm -hmm. or something. Is there a way that eventually I could buy fruit from like, you know, Peru? Yeah. You know, the, uh, definitely, you know, that's part of the whole goal because there's, so I talk about, you know, uh, grocery chains because normally they're the ones that import food from elsewhere because they buy, you know, huge amount of volume. But you have a lot of independent uh, grocery stores, you know, less than people that own less than 50 stores, you know, one to 50 stores. In the U.S., I believe there's about 7,900 independent grocery stores uh, owners. Uh, the biggest problem is competing with volume, purchasing volumes. You know, they can't compete with, you know, with a Walmart or a Safeway buying huge amounts. But our platform can actually aggregate their buying power that allows them to buy a little bit cheaper because of the high volumes, you know, and, and so we can do that with independent stores. So yeah, there's no reason why you should not be able to, through our platform, you know, buy a uh, product that comes from another country um, just because we give the retailer the option to be able to do that. You don't have to be a Walmart on my platform to use, to be able to buy from my farmer in, in Peru, but you know, but that's, that's the long-term goal, right? That if you buy that product from a farmer in Peru, that when that farmer needs financial support, instead of going to a bank, he can come to the community that we've built of consumers, you know, holding our cryptocurrency and create a 360 degree support, you know, back and forth. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, there's just all sorts of foods around the world that, you know, I just, I'm thinking about the future, man. It's really exciting. 
I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come and talk to us. And I hope you can come back. And once it scales up a little bit, we can talk again. Yeah, definitely. I would, I would love to do that. Yeah. And uh, it's really exciting for me to be able to know that we could potentially connect consumers and farmers and truckers, you know, directly without anybody else being involved in dictating cost of food or, you know, when we should buy this food or from where. This is the next step, really, where you group together consumers. So let's say uh, consumers want to buy strawberries from uh, the best source. You've got, let's say you've got 100 consumers in California, and in total they want a certain amount of strawberries. You can connect them directly with the farmer, and you've also got the transport arranged. So then suddenly you're grouping up your consumers and your suppliers and getting rid of that many-to-many relationship by being the actual middleman which makes this work. And that, that cuts out a lot of steps in between. And that means that everybody wins. You get a better product. It's delivered fresher. And this means that the farmer makes more money, which means hopefully they can reinvest into uh, their produce. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and with, with that information, you can eventually go to a farmer and be able to say, you know, instead of planting, you know, sweet corn this year, uh, you know, you should think about planting tomatoes because this is what the market is demanding right now. This is what consumers on the other side are looking for. So now you're doing, you know, predictable farming because you're providing data to the farmers based on the needs of consumers. You know, instead of a farmer saying, I'm going to sell your corn because that's what I grew this year. You know, you say, oh, I don't want corn today. You know, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a big impact on how you do everything else. You, you really change it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You really change that, that model. And with the, with the blockchain supporting it. Um, one question before we, we uh let our listeners go because I know that everybody must be listening to this thinking this this is fantastic. I need to find out more. What about security implications? How are you, how are you protecting yourself against um, any hacking of the blockchain, etc.? You know that's a that's the part that we're looking at right now. There's there's two things when it comes to the technology. You know we because because it's an enterprise solution, right? Business to business, we have to look at the the public part of the uh, blockchain that allows you know, consumers and, and retailers be ha- access to data on, on, on where the food is coming from. But then there's the other private aspect of the transaction, you know, that businesses need to protect their data. So that's right now what we are considering. We have, you know, our blockchain advisors and security uh, advisors that are working with us to, to do that. And as, and as we do the implementation of blockchain, you know, we'll make sure that you know, we bring in our, our, our community of, you know, blockchain hackers to come and, you know, work with us to make sure that whatever we're building is going to be protected at the end of the day. Um, you know, so, but, you know, my, my engineering team is, it's, you know, exploring all the options that we have to decide what's going to work best, you know. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for your time. If you j- just, just tell us what's the website again, we should all be going. Yeah, so the website is uh, E-H-H-I-C-O. Dot com. So there we go, listeners. Uh, that was it. That is how you're going to be getting your strawberries in the future. And that is why you're going to be getting better quality and we're going to be supporting farmers in a blockchain manner. Thank you very much for your time, sir. That's been very interesting and we will keep in touch with you. Great. Thanks for having me. Love to uh, be back. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for downloading this podcast. Don't forget, keep the donations coming in and the feedback. We do enjoy some feedback. Keep downloading, tell your friends, and we'll be back with more interesting information next week. Thank you very much, and speak to you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Are you looking for an easy way to buy Bitcoin or Ether on a safe, secure platform? Coinbase is the easiest place to buy and sell digital currencies. Sign up today as a friend of the blockchain show, and if you buy or sell $100 of Bitcoin or more, you'll earn $10 of free Bitcoin for yourself and $10 of Bitcoin to support this show. Join now using the link in this episode's show notes at theblockchainshow.com.
To learn more, visit theblockchainshow.com.